Parato Samma Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Rato Samma Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Rato Samma Sambudasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. We pay homage to him and to the Dharma Sadhu Sadhu Sadhu. So hello, everybody, and I hope that you had a good week. And uh, I was uh, wanting to kind of promote a book here uh, today. Oh, so it's behind my head. Um, there's a book here called um, The Teachings of the Buddha uh, on Social and Communal Harmony that Bhikkhu Bodhi wrote. He put it together, and I really like it. He did this in 2016, and this book has been, uh, uh, some people that I'm working with, they've been using this quite a bit. And, um, and the one thing that impressed me was that he actually had in this book included uh, information from the Kalama Sutta. He had that as a section, and what he did in this book he had this broken down into some sections. Let's see if I can explain it to you. And it's really worth getting it because um, he has one, the first section is right understanding and the second section is personal training. And the third section is virtuous behavior. Let's see. That's a second, I'm sorry. Personal training is divided between generosity, virtuous behavior, removing the defilements of mind, and loving kindness and compassion. The third section is dealing with anger. And that one is broken down into an introduction section that he writes an introduction section and then he puts abbreviated pieces of different suttas in for you. It's not hyper long, it's not hard reading. And this part has removing anger, patience under provocation, exemplars of patience. And then the fourth section of the book is proper speech. And there's uh, eight different uh, sections that he covers on that. And then good friendship the qualities of a true friend, we've done that before, and the four kinds of good friends, we've done that one before too. And the sixth, sec the sixth section, he has uh, one's own good and the good of others. And it's a short section, that's really nice too. And then the, the seventh section is intentional communities. The kinds of communities, the formation of a community, sustaining community, caste is irrelevant in the community, and um, the model of monastic harmony that he pulls out. And then in section eight are disputes, the introduction, and then in 10, a nine, section nine is settling the disputes, and then in section 10, establishing an equitable society and goes through a section that's really nice because it goes through reciprocal uh, responsibilities and it goes through parents and children, husbands and wives, the household, the social status, and the state. So he's put together this, it's really good in how to deal with uh, so many different things that we ask about. And in one section there came up, and I'll be darned if I can find it now. And I meant to mark it. <clears throat> so I'm probably gonna use the Kalama to show you this first, but the, the thing that the um, Buddha set up for, since this is really on the, um, relationship, I set this up as a relationship between the teacher and the student, which is really important to understand. And I don't think 
that everybody understands that in the Buddhist system, when you are ordained, that the monks that ordain you, uh, in the early part, especially as a novice and then as a junior, that time that you spend and the originals with the with the teacher, the primary teacher, there is this reciprocal agreement that is there. And I don't think it comes across. I've, I've had people say, why did you let them do that to you? <laughs> and I'm there, they weren't doing anything to me. I fully and completely understood the reciprocal agreement between my teacher and myself before I was or ordained. And so when that person uh, is ordained, it looks like something is happening to me by the teacher and I'm making an agreement, 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 agreement. But what's actually happening is they're taking me under their wing and they're, uh, they're part of the reciprocal agreement is to make sure I have housing and food and I'm taken care of and uh, with medicine and um, the needs, the basic for, uh, for requisites that the monk or the nun tries to maintain. And so, um, be the housing and the food and the clothing and the medicinal needs for what's happening. And so that's been how it's been for 21 years or 22 years now. And that's how it's honestly worked, you know, to be supporting the Dhamma and making a total commitment completely to the Dhamma of, of spending time basically all, only on that in relationship to how it works and how it helps people. And our thrust at Dhamma Sukha meditation in the beginning was always to, to work towards um, leading people to be able to see, uh, guiding people. And we like to say guide, you know, we had a, a serious conversation about this before I came the first teacher, you know, I became the first teacher. And so what was the discussion was, am I going to become a teacher? I was a little disturbed by a teacher at that, and, and then bothered later by the, what happens with gurus in, in India and in, the Himalayas and things like that. And the, the, the setup didn't, it didn't seem like it would work in modern times. People would go off on it, you know, off track and not understand it because the real purpose of the teacher is to point. That's it. We point. We spend all our time watching you really closely. When we're working with you closely, we're, we're watching you carefully and we're listening to everything you're saying, and you're actually telling us what to say back to you. And that's interesting too, <laughs> you know, because if we listen carefully to what you say to us in interview, then we get almost the precise sentence we need to say back to you to continue working to straighten that out, because you're telling us precisely of what isn't there that we need to need to hear and the description of what you're telling us. So the five questions that are used in the interview system became a real point of, do we need any more questions? And I think eventually we accepted, we, Bonte and I accepted a sixth question. And that was, what is your current object of meditation when you come in the door? But those five questions we ask you when you're going through your interview are really refined. People don't understand this. You know, first of all, how long was the longest sitting that you had in the last 24 hours? If you're doing a retreat, if you're keeping track day to day and you give us a time, that's just the answer. You give us time. Uh, and then the second question is, how long were you able to stay on your object of meditation before mind's attention moves away from that object of meditation and does something else? Okay. And it's your attention moves, the attention moves, how long? It could be one minute. We don't accept seconds, okay? We don't wanna hear about them. We just wanna hear about minutes. And that gives us a feeling, uh, a chance to, um, it, it gives us a chance to tell exactly where you are with the beginning part of your practice, okay? The next one is when you were pulled away so that you were, paying attention to the distraction instead of the, the, the uh, object of meditation, what did you do? 
And you have to tell us what you did in your own words, the first thing that comes to your mind. And the one thing that is illegal to say is I six art. You cannot do that. You cannot tell us that. Because of this, the people here, there are now 12 people here, and there could be 12 different ways of six art. So we need each person to tell us precisely what you did when you were pulled away, because that determines how you will move forward easily or you will have problems. And we have to hear you say it to us. So you can't say, oh, I six art. You have to say exactly when you uh, when you were pulled away, hopefully that you, you know, like you let go of you recognized what that there was a distraction and immediately you you let go, you relaxed your head and you smiled and you came back. But I don't want you to memorize this either. I want you to tell me what exactly you did when you're talking to me in an interview. So it gets hard, doesn't it? It gets really hard because when we're starting to work online, a lot of what we discovered about tranquil wisdom insight meditation is we need to see you. Mm, we need to see you. And so a lot of what we try to do, we, we have to do on faith. And then the more books that are printed about this, the more we need to see you personally. And I think that's the wisdom of the elder monks. I think that's what they knew for a long time. That even with any meditation, if you start printing in detail too much, people, you don't know who comes into your retreat and sits down and tries to recite to you what they just read in the book last night. And then it gets complicated because if I'm writing back to you in an online retreat, how, how do I know that you're telling me the truth? And can, do I have time to do... Uh, you know, online uh, Zooms with people where it's going to be 15, 20, 30 minutes and you never come out for air. <laughs> it gets very complicated this way. So we have to decide each person who's teaching how much they want to do. And some people want to automate it and they automate it with forms. And then you don't get much of a feeling, much of a connection at all with the person. It's just a form going back and forth and you don't know how well that can work, you know, the intuition between the two of you is cut, cut uh, even smaller. So it gets even more difficult when you're trying to work with students that way. So these are the things that we've been up against and in, in, in doing this over time. First of all, let's, let's look at the Kalama Sutta because I want, I want you to see something special about the Buddha, his teaching and the way he was working with his uh, with his students, his agreement, he had a teacher-student relationship that was just totally different from what was going on with the Nagantha Naputa or any of the other teachers at that time. It was like, don't question the teacher, take what the teacher says, do it. But here comes the Buddha, and he just violates that. And he says there is a teacher-student relationship. And basically, this is what I want you to understand. So, Let's look at the Kalama first. Now, this one comes out of the Anguja Nikaya, but this has been abbreviated. This one was retranslated by my teacher and by Usalananda. And I think if I'm not mistaken, I think it happened that that was done in, um, in 2005 or something like that. Okay, so maybe... It, it was before that, I think it was 2000. Okay, so it's in the in the book of threes and, and the, based on this on Sutta 65, the Kesaputiya Sutta. So this is what, let's see if I can pull this guy up here. I don't know how, I'll put you off the side, there you go. Okay. It is unwise to simply believe what one hears because it has been said over and over again for a long time. This was a problem at that time because they were accepting uh, within the religions, they were looking at accepting things that had been written for thousands of years and were recited. And you know, I never quite believed that it was the way Bunty was describing it to me until I was in New York where Bhikkhu Bodhi is at the... Uh, the Buddhist Association of the United States 
It's in Carlisle, New York. And there were some students that came to the retreat that we did there. And, and when Bonte was teaching that retreat, I had an opportunity to interview four students who were studying the, Upa the Vedas and the Upanishads. And they were teenagers and they were being taught in the traditional way. And it was exactly, exactly the way Bonte had told me it was. And today they were taught to memorize, to recite, to recite back afterwards, and then no questions, no questions. It is the way it is, that's it. And there was no discussion. And I was kind of surprised because I thought in modern times there would be more discussion going on, but apparently this kind of thing still goes on. So he's the, here's the Buddha coming and saying, it's unwise to simply believe what one hears because it has been said over and over again for a long time. And they're talking many generations. It is unwise to follow tradition blindly just because it has been practiced in that way for a long time. It is unwise to listen to and spread rumors and gossip. It is unwise to take anything as being the absolute truth just because it agrees with one's scriptures without practicing to see through direct experience if they are true or not. This was a new idea, okay? Um, and even in our system, you can say without practicing to see, well, he's directing you in the scriptures itself on two aspects of acknowledgement of the teaching. And the first one is, I want you to practice to gain knowledge through seeing. Knowledge and vision is that attainment means that you've trained your mind to examine something and take the knowledge by seeing it actually work. So this is what knowledge and vision is. And he's basically, he's teaching a cornerstone that means the cornerstone on the building for the foundation of that building of knowledge and wisdom is knowledge and vision. So he, in one of the suttas, he actually, the monk has decides to leave and he decides to leave because he doesn't want to practice that way. And the, basically they said, then don't be here, don't, don't stay. And he decides to leave. So it is unwise to take anything as being absolute truth just because it agrees with one's scriptures is what this is talking about without practicing to see through direct experience if they are not are true or not. That was what was put in by Usalananda. Now, it is unwise to foolishly make assumptions without honest investigation to see if they are correct or not. That's testing, constantly testing. What we're doing now over here is I'm basically sending people out and saying, if you don't understand this, this is what it is. And we don't need to talk about it all afternoon. I just need you to go down and start working it with people around you and seeing what's happening and watch what's happening. And pretty soon you'll come to understand it is working the same way with everybody. And then they do this and they practice it for themselves and come back and say, you know, <laughs> I just found out it's the same with everybody and I can watch people doing the same actions again, again, I'm talking, I'm talking about dependent origination right now. Okay. It is unwise to go by the mere appearance or to hold too tightly onto any view or idea because one is just comfortable with it. So again, testing, testing, seeing how it works, but still watching everything in the present time to see if there's any variation is training yourself to be here now. And when you're here now with what is only, what is essentially happening, that means you're not looking at what is unessential, like this, what's happening is like what's in the past, so it must be the same thing's going to happen, or we should do the same thing. Don't do that. Try to look at it as an individual event and do what is essentially needed in the event for what's essentially happening. That's why we always say that that one uh, statement about what's essential and what's unessential each morning when we're at retreat. It is unwise to be convinced of anything out of respect and deference for one spiritual teacher, 
without first practicing and investigating what is being taught. You can stay devoted to a teacher as long as what they're saying is working. You can do what you want. But if you stay with one, it makes logical sense to stay with that teacher. If you can communicate well with them and have a discussion about anything pertaining to what's happening, that's great especially if you have somebody that you can do that with. And then you're practicing what you're learning and you're investigating what is being taught and you're not just saying, oh, this is what he, he teaches and this is what is right. That's what they're trying to, he was trying to get them uh, the, the Kalamas away from. And this, this sutta actually happened, this sutta, uh, this is a summation of it, but this sutta actually happened in a village where the Kalamas, a uh, group of people, were confused and they came to the Buddha and said, you know, many teachers are coming here, but we don't know what the truth is and what's not the truth. Can you tell us which one is true and which one is false or how can we figure it out? And this is what the instruction was. Now, it may be good idea for all of us to go beyond our own opinions, beliefs and dogmatic thinking. In this way, we can rightly reject anything which, when accepted, practiced, and perfected, it leads to more anger, criticism, conceit, frustration, pride, greed, or delusion. These unwholesome states of mind are universally condemned and are certainly not beneficial to ourselves or to others. These unskilled ways of acting and thinking are best to be avoided whenever possible. On the other hand, we can rightly accept anything which when it's practiced and perfected, it leads to unconditional love, contentment, and soft wisdom. These things allow us to develop a happy, tranquil and peaceful mind. Thus, the wise praise all kinds of unconditional love, loving acceptance of the present moment, tranquility, contentment, and gentle wisdom. And they encourage everyone to practice these uplifting qualities as much as possible. So here it goes all the way back to 1990 when he first, um, when he uh, translated this, the two of them, they did this out in California. So that is the end of this document. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Let try to go like this, I think. Okay, whoops, <laughs> I lost you. Let me see if I can get you back. Um, what did I do? New share. There. Okay. Um, how do I do that? I bet you I do it this way. There. Okay. Now I go back and share again. So do you, you see what he was doing? First of all, do you see what he was doing? With by, by doing this, he was trying to wake up the desire to really understand something only by seeing it and believing it. That's the basis for this. And this was brand new. Now he goes into even more when, when he, is, he is questioned by Toei, uh, Tohei, I can't remember his name. Toei, I think it was Tohei or something. In, in the Chanki Sutta, let's look at what happens there. Now, I'm not going to go through. We're going to skip part of this. Oh, we are. Mm -hmm. Ah, we have to go in and open it up again, I guess. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the lessons in the Chonky Sutta cover the perfect student-teacher relationship for achieving the highest grades possible for each person following this advice. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to say, oh, you can't see it. Nah, 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 nah. Let's see, how do I do this? Okay, got to go back. And...
maybe. <laughs> this is fun, isn't it? <laughs> All right, here we go. There. That's it, yeah? Okay, you can see it now, right? Okay. So the lessons in the Chonky no. Sutra, you can't, can't I see it? See it. Uh, now I can see it. I can, I can, I can, see, I can see it. I can see it. Okay, okay. Okay, the lessons in the Chanki Sutta cover the perfect student-teacher relationship for achieving the highest grades possible for each person following this advice in any subject in college, in anything that you decide to do in life. I'm going to push this because if you take this advice, you can become an expert in whatever you want to become an expert at. And how do you become an expert at something? You do it until you drop. <laughs> You keep doing the same thing until it becomes a, a part of, of you and you become you, you become able to uh, go to the source each time, anytime you want. We're going to go through this. This was happening in the uh, the Kosalan, uh, a Kosalan country and uh, it was a village named Oposada. And there, the Blessed One was there in the God's Grove and the, the solitary grove is to the north of Oposad is where he stayed. Now, they always give these directions, you know, and when you're in India, you can actually go to these places and you can find just about where the person was standing. It's kind of cool, you know, when you, when you want to track these things down. On that occasion, Chanki was ruling over the, over Upasada. Oposada and the crown property abounding in living beings, rich in grasslands, woodlands, waterways, and grains, and royal endowment. He, it was a good place. There you go. And a sacred grant had been given to him by King Pasanati of Kosala. And he's there. And what's happening is the Buddha has arrived. And the front part of this, I'm not going to go through that part because I really just want to go through the the pieces of what he says to the teacher-student relationship. But the first part of the sutta, I call it the big brag. <laughs> so the first of all, the, the Brahmins are saying uh, that um, they're praising uh, the, the leader here. And um, they are explaining how great he is and how he's trained and everything. But then the leader turns around, Chanki turns around, and he, he explains to them that at the same time, the Buddha is trained completely in the same way as, as he was trained. So actually, because he's a holy man and he's discovered this, he thinks it would be proper for him to go and see Gotama and not request that Gotama come and see him. So out of respect, that's what he decides to do. And then they all get in their wagons. They all load up everything they possibly can imagine in these wagons and servants and everything. And then they go uh, to see the Buddha. Now, when they get there, there is a discussion going on between these Brahmins who are very well trained and very well educated. And there is one young Brahmin that is there and this young Brahmin, trying to get to where his name is here, he, um, he has a lot of questions. Okay, let's see if we can get there. And all of a sudden the blessed one rebukes the young Brahmin student Kapatika, and Kapatika is told, and he, Bharadvaja means young student, means the youngest student or junior student, and he says, let not the venerable Bharadvaja break in and interrupt the talk of the very senior Brahmins while they are conversing. Let the venerable Bharadvaja wait until the talk is finished, but then what happens is, um, when this was said, they tell Master Gotama, that the Brahmin student is very good with his delivery. He's wise. He's capable of taking part in the discussion with Master Gotama. And then the Blessed One thought, well, let's see what happens. Let's see what he does now. And then 
he starts out with a question in regards to the ancient Brahmanic hymns that have come down through oral tradition, transmission, and in the scriptural collections that we learn, uh, the Brahmins come to the def definite conclusion, only this is true, anything else is wrong. And what does Master Gautama say about this? And then he says to the student, how then among the Brahmins is there even a single Brahmin who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong. And the student says, no, Master Gautama, nobody says that. How then among the Brahmins is there even a single teacher or a single teacher's teacher back to the seventh generation of teachers who, who says this, I know this, I see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong. No, Master Gautama. So how then uh, the ancient Brahmin seers and creators, the hymns, composers of hymns and ancient hymns were formally chanted, uttered and compiled the Brahmins nowadays still chant and repeat the repeating what was spoken and reciting what was what was recited. And then he mentions all the names of the great teachers that were there before and how they're reciting this exactly the same way, still exactly what they said is exactly true. And how each one of these has handed it down generation, 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 word to word. He says, we know this, we see this, uh, only this is true. Anything else is wrong. Ha have they said that about this? And they and he says, no, no, they haven't. So you see, Gotama figured out. He figured out a new way of approaching things that was shockingly different from what anybody else was doing. And basically what it was, was to only get involved in teaching what he knew, what he did in his practice specifically. And then step-by-step, step, teaching other people after six years of working with this to get through all the way and open his mind, he figures out that the only way for me to teach is to show them how to do the same investigation I did and practice the same practice. And that way, uh, they will be seeing something, knowing it by seeing it. That's what I think I'm going to do. And that's what he decides to do. So then he has a discussion with the young Brahmin where first he said, he says, the Brahmins honor this not only out of faith, Master Gautama, he argues, but they also honor it out of oral tradition. But then he says to the young student, first you took your stand on faith, but now you're speaking about oral tradition. And then he says, there are five things that may turn out in two different ways here. And now, what five? So the five things that can turn out different ways are faith, approval, okay, oral tradition, reasoned cogitation, reasoning it out, and reflective acceptance of a view. They can come out different ways. They can come out two different ways here and now. Something may be fully accepted out of faith, and yet it may be empty, hollow, and false. But something else may not be fully accepted out of faith, and yet it may be factual, true, and unmistaken. So now we're seeing more almost of a scientific approach that he's beginning to talk about. Again, something may be fully approved of, and it can be well transmitted, well cogitated, discussed and everything, and well reflected upon, and yet it may be empty, hollow and false, but something else may not be well reflected upon, and it may be factual and true and unmistaken. Under these conditions, it is not proper for wise men uh, who preserves truth to come to a definite conclusion that only this is true and anything else is false because it can be taken different ways. But Master Gotama, in what way is there the preservation of truth? How does one preserve truth? We ask Master Gotama about the preservation of truth. If a person has faith, this is what the Buddha says, 
He preserves truth when he says, my faith is thus, but he does not yet come to the definite conclusion, only this is true and anything else is wrong. In this way, there is the preservation of truth. In this way, he preserves truth. In this way, we describe the preservation of truth, but as yet there is no discovery of truth. And then he said that if a person approves of something, if he receives an oral tradition, if he reaches a conclusion based on reasoned cog cogitation, if he gains a reflective acceptance of a view, he preserves truth when he says, my reflective acceptance of this view is thus. But he does not yet come to the definite conclusion, only this is true and everything else is wrong. So it's about speaking specifically. It's about when you're teaching, also understanding that what you say, you have to not say just because you know it and experience it and you want to get it across to somebody that way. You have to also think about the person who's never heard it before, what they could take this as that you're saying. So you have to be thinking, I'm saying this, but how could it be taken by a beginner? How could it be taken by someone else? And it's tricky. It just takes a lot of practice in doing this, okay? Only this is true, anything else is wrong, but still he doesn't have a definite conclusion of that. There is a preservation of truth, in this way, he preserves truth. In this way, he, we describe the preservation of truth, but we're not, this is still not yet the discovery of truth. So here they are talking about how can we actually discover the truth of, of what is real and what isn't. And Godam is coming at this a bit differently, isn't he? Because he's not just basing it on what he also learned when he was growing up. It wasn't enough for him. In that way, Master Gautama, there's the preservation of truth. In that way, one preserves truth. But in, in that way, we, we recognize the preservation of the truth. But in what way is there the discovery of truth? In what way does one discover truth? We're asking you about the discovery of truth itself. So here, the young student, um, he says to him, a monk may be living in dependence on some village or town, and the householder or householder's son goes to him and investigates him in regards to three kinds of states. In regards to states based on greed, is the teacher greedy? In regard to states based on hatred, does he express hatred a lot? And in regards to states based on delusion, is he, is he selfish a lot and self-centered? in delusion. Are there in this venerable one any states based on greed such that his mind is obsessed by the states while not knowing he might say I know or while not seeing he might say I see or he might urge others to act in a way uh, that would lead to their harm and suffering for a long time. As he investigates him uh, he comes to know there are no such states based on greed in this venerable one. The bodily behavior and the verbal behavior of the venerable one are not those of one affected by greed. And the Dhamma that this venerable one teaches is profound, hard to see, and hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning. It is subtle to be experienced by the wise. This Dhamma cannot easily be taught by one who is affected by greed. You'll see the same statement again. You'll find this exact same statement that's here in uh, Sutta number 72 in section 18, where he's the Buddha is discussing with Vajikati later on in his teaching. This teaching is not something you can mix up other things with. You may not change the ingredients. You have to just take it as it is, and you have to experience it as you see it, is what he's talking about when you get over there. Okay, when he is has, has investigated him, has seen that he purified from states based on greed, he next investigates in regards to based on hatred, 
Are there in the venerable one any states based on hate such that with his mind obsessed by those states while not knowing it, he might say, I know, and while not seeing, he might say, I see. Uh, he might urge others to act in a way uh, that would lead to their harm and suffering for a long time. And as he investigates him, he comes to know there are no such states based on hate in this venerable one. The bodily behavior and the verbal behavior of the venerable one are not those of one that's affected by hate. And the uh, Dhamma that is uh, this venerable one is teaching is very profound. It's hard to see and understand. It's sublime and unattainable by mere reasoning. What is mere reasoning? Re reading books and just basing it on hearing what somebody has been reciting and reciting and reciting. You're just learning to recite it also. He investigates him in regard to these states of delusion also. And he finds the same thing with delusion, same situation. So when he has investigated this, he has seen that he purified from the states of delusion. Then he places faith in him. Filled with faith, he visits him. He pays respect to him. And having paid respect to him, he gives ear. And when he gives ear, he hears the Dhamma. And having heard the Dhamma, he memorizes it and examines the meaning of the teachings he has memorized. And when he examines their meaning, he gains a reflective acceptance and of uh, those teachings, okay? When he has gained the reflective acceptance, enthusiasm springs up. And when enthusiasm has sprung up, he applies his will. And having applied his will, he scrutinizes. Having scrutinized, he strives. And resolutely striving, he realizes with the body the supreme truth and seeing it by penetrating it with wisdom. And in this way, there is the discovery of truth. In this way, one discovers the truth. In this way, we describe the discovery of truth. But as yet, there is no final arrival at truth. So in that way, these are the pieces he's going to discuss now, and he is going to, to uh, go through these pieces. In that way, Ven Master Gotama, there's the discovery of truth. But in, in that way, one discovers truth. In that way, we would discover the discovery of truth. But in what way is it a final arrival at truth? In what way? does one finally arrive at truth? We're asking you about the final arrival at truth. Ah, the final arrival at truth lies in the repetition, development, and cultivation of these things. Ah, yeah. Now this goes to neurocognitive science a minute. And what did they come up with in their cognitive psychology research? How do we retrain a brain from an old habit? How do we let it go? How do we change the habit, come with a new habit and way of thinking and living and acting? How do we do that? We do it through repetition, development, and cultivation of right effort. And we do this by repeating to the brain over and over again, to let go of the unwholesome, relax and smile, replace it with a smile, which is wholesome and come back to what we're doing in the present time. And when we keep doing that, then we have the repetition development and cultivation of moving towards the truth of staying in the present time, of staying in seeing precisely what is essentially happening and finishing something that we're doing from beginning to the end. This is how he's, he's talking to, about applying this. So now we're going to ask that this is, there is the final arrival of truth, but in, in that way, the final finally arrives at truth, but in that way, we recognize the final arrival of truth. But what is the most helpful for the final arrival at truth? So the young, the young student is not, Looking it together, he's used to hearing it this way on Monday, the next piece on Tuesday, the next part on Thursday, and such that you don't get to hook it together. Now he's going to show you how this works. Striving is most helpful for the final arrival at truth. Here we go through these parts. If one does not strive and striving has been identified 
as right effort happening automatically now. And we when we see that that these the striving, right striving and right effort are described in the exact same way, we realize these two are appearing the way the faculties and the powers appeared in the 37 requisites of enlightenment, where the faculties were something you have to watch each one of them, but the powers became powers because they became automatic. And if we assume that and we start testing it, we find out, oh, if we strive uh, to keep the right effort going continually, then it will flip and our minds will do it naturally within about two months time from the time you take a retreat. If you were to keep it going, we have students that just kept it going about two months. And this matches up with the description of between 66 and 83 days, I think were the results of two different research projects on how long does it take for this kind of thing to happen for the change in the habit to happen. And this is, this is the same sort of thing. How long does it take for this to become automatically part of what I do all the time? But what Master Godama is most helpful for striving we ask you what's most helpful for striving and scrutiny is most helpful for striving. If one does not scrutinize, carefully scrutinize what it is that you're learning, write it down. And remember, I told you a long time ago when I was living in Taiwan, I went to the school next to where I lived in, in China, uh, Republic of China. And on the doors, they had a little thing. You, you see it when she writes it on the board. You hear it when the teacher says it. You write it down on the paper and you repeat it out of your mouth and then you do it. That's how we learn. And this was on the sign, was on the door of every single classroom in the school. You see it, you hear it, you say it, you write it, you do it, you know it. That's how you know it. You're not gonna mess up on the exam. You know it if you do that. So what happened in that process was that you were repeating, 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 and again and again, repetition is what the striving for the repetition of the right effort was what was happening for you. So what is most helpful for scrutiny? Application of your will is most helpful for scrutiny. I can't fix it for you. Sorry, folks. <laughs> I can't fix it for you. I can't come and just pluck it away from you. I wish I could. I could get on the phone and just go like this all day. Pluck, pluck, pluck with your, that would be cool, wouldn't it? Suffering, suffering, suffering. Okay, and then put a big smile up here and say, everybody smile. <laughs> but I can't. You have to be doing this to your own mind. Enthusiasm is the most helpful thing uh, for the application of your will. You have to get enthusiastic about the research that I've been showing you with habit, habits being changed. And I got really enthusiastic about that. And so are my students. And then what is most helpful for the enthusiasm? Reflective acceptance of the teachings. Once that you do that, then you have to reflect on what you wrote down. And you are constantly, you see people walking around with notes in their pockets before exams and they're learning stuff to remember, 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 remember. And this is part of it. But if you look at all that he put in here, all of it, you would see he put the whole program in here, what you had to do to get that A in whatever it is you want to get the A in. That's reflective. That's why reflective acceptance, the teachings is most helpful for the enthusiasm. And then what is the most helpful for the reflective acceptance of the uh, reflective acceptance of the uh, teachings? Examination of the meaning. It's the most helpful thing for the reflective acceptance. That's what you have to do as they're telling you, you, you examine the meaning and, most, and write whatever notes you have in the side of whatever it is you're learning. And if one does not examine their meaning, one will not gain a reflective acceptance of the teaching. But because one examines the meaning, one will gain a reflective acceptance of the teaching. And what is the most helpful thing for the reflective acceptance of the teaching? Ah, the examination of the meaning. And the examination of the meaning 
memorizing the teachings is the most helpful for examining the meaning. And what is, uh, because one memorizes the teaching, one examines the meaning. You walk around saying it all the time. Pretty soon you're going to get in the car and you're going to just say, I know this. I know this. When I learned the, the, uh, all the, the pieces, the basic structure, the five aggregates of the human being, the six, the six uh, sense doors, the six internal sense doors and the six external parts for those sense doors, okay? And then the three kinds of feeling, okay? And you, you do the Four Noble Truths in the beginning. That was the very first one you learned. Why are we doing this? Because we're going to figure out suffering, the cause of it, the cessation of it, and how to get to the cessation of it once and for all. And this is the way. Mental and physical suffering, simply, it just goes away, basically. And you can, if it doesn't go away, if you're caught with something that is not going to go away, you can deal with it a lot easier because you know what it is and you know how to handle it. And there are things that you can do with it to help it, okay? But diving into it and saying, oh, this is me, this is mine, this is myself. Oh my God, this is awful. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if you do that, it really hurts all that much more. But if you look at it and say, look, this is here. It has a cause. It hurts. I can't sleep. I have to get up and walk at night. Okay, well, that's what's here. You accept it, you work with it, and you do the best that you can do. Hearing the Dhamma is most helpful for memorizing the teaching. Of course it is. So you play the, the suttas that are about this, which I've tried to you know, get put together, try to get to a place where we could print a uh, the, the big index project that we had to try and help you, help you see this is this subject so you can go and find this sutta and you see reading it, read don't read it once, read it five times and then record it yourself reading it or find a recording of it and then listen to it for every day for a week and see what you know at the end. And you're going to hear different things in it each time you hear it. Oh, look at that. I didn't see that before. Oh, wow. Look at that. You see? It's going to come up like that. Hearing the Dhamma is most successful for memorizing the teachings. And what is the most helpful for, the, uh, for memorizing the teachings? Giving ear is most helpful for hearing the Dhamma. If you don't give ear and listen to these suttas, just calm yourself and listen only to the sutta. That is why giving ear is most helpful to hearing the Dhamma. You're only that's just going in your head and it's going to one place, the Dhamma library in your head. <laughs> that's where it's going. And it's going to touch your heart. It builds everything structurally stronger. And what is the most helpful thing for giving ear? Paying respect for giving ear is most helpful for giving ear. It means coming here to the class. It means listening to going over these suttas, listening to not just to the suttas, but sometimes taking them apart like this. And then that's the most helpful thing for you for giving ear is to actually pay respect to a teacher and most helpful for giving ear so that you can listen to it often. And what is the uh, most helpful thing for paying respect? Visiting is most helpful for paying respect because it does want, if one does not visit a teacher, one will not pay respect to him. And when you, but because you visit the teacher, pay respect to him, that's what the most, res, most helpful thing for paying respect and, and, list, and giving ear to the Dhamma is. And then what is the most helpful thing for paying respect? But think we I think we ran out of this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he visits him, and that is why faith, faith is the most helpful for visiting. Faith is okay. And faith, what kind of faith is in Buddhism? Faith is different than faith was faith was in a blind faith of uh trusting in something that I couldn't see, couldn't experience uh myself except for years and years and years of training as say uh, um, some of the nuns I know, you know, but, but in, in, in blind faith is where it's not applicable. The whole thing that I'm looking at is not applicable here and now. I have to trust someone to tell me this is what it was. This is what it did. This is it. 
but there's no, there's not this kind of examination to see precisely how everything works. So when we look at this, the summation of it is, we go to you about the preservation of truth and you answered about the preservation of truth. We approved and accepted that answer. And so we are satisfied. And we went to you about discovery of truth and you showed us about the discovery of truth. You, we, we approve and, of and accept the answer. And so we are satisfied. We asked Master Godama about the final arrival of truth. And Master Godama answered us about the final arrival at truth. And we approve and accept that answer. And so we are satisfied. We asked Master Godam about the thing that was most helpful for the arrival, final arrival of truth. And this was the, the core structure the student wanted was that final thing, arrival of truth. And he gave him a step-by-step -step program. And Master Godam answered the thing most helpful for the final arrival of truth. We approve and accept of that. And he answered for us and approved and accepted the answers and formally, Formerly, Master Godama, we used to think, wow, who are these bald pated recluses? <laughs> these people running around in robes who are bald headed. Who are they? These swarthy, menial offspring of uh, the kinsman's feet that they would understand the Dhamma. They thought they were far superior to what the Buddha had, had been uh, teaching and were totally full of everything that they needed to know. But then they turned around. Master Godam is inspired in, in me now a love for recluses, a confidence in recluses, a reverence for these recluses. And at the end, it's a lovely ending of the sutta. Magnificent Master Godama, magnificent Master Godama. And then he said to the Blessed One, magnificent Master Godama, magnificent Godama. Master Godama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though we were turning upright what had been overthrown. And this is a standard clause of what it is he's discovered when he shows somebody the light. From this point, if you want to highlight it, uh, he has uh, cleared in many ways as though we were turning upright what had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden showing the way to one who was lost, holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Godama for refuge and to the Dhamma and the Sangha of bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. From day today, let Master Godama uh, remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. Let the Blessed One, together with the Sangha of monks, consent to accept tomorrow's meal from me. And so he prepares a meal, of course, for the Buddha and 500 monks. <laughs> That's always fun, consenting to bring a banquet for it. So tossing this out and you're looking at this uh, list, you know, as we see it. Um, what do you think about this? This is a, a really clear way of what uh, it takes in order for us to actually learn a subject and to really internalize the subject and take it to ourselves completely so that we really understand and can show it to you because we've practiced it, we've seen it, we know it, and we're talking to you about it. And that's what I find pretty amazing, you know, in, in this change for me anyway, from coming from 50 years old <laughs> of running around in different Christian churches where I felt content and I was comfortable and I was happy, but I never really thought about this part of it until I totally completely crashed. And when I crashed, I think that's where I probably had the most doubt about everything. I was so frustrated from 41, 42 years old until I found a teacher at 50 years old. So I start at half a century. <laughs> and now go another uh, 25 years uh, to, to look at this and say, wow, this, this guy was really serious about finding the answer and not leaving me without a guiding 
footprint as to how to do this for myself. He's not going to give it to me. He's going to tell me repeatedly how to do it for myself, step by step. So what do you all think about this? I think it's pretty wild myself. <laughs> pretty daring of him to do this. Yeah, you, what's up? <laughs> Uh, hello, Sister Gimma. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for uh, yeah, such a succinct summary of, uh, of the Sutta. But I've got a, a, couple, of, uh, a couple of questions, uh, as always. Um, and, and some of them are about detail and some of them not. But first of all, I'd just like you to say a little bit more about that originating faith, because that seems to be the start of the process. Um, yeah, so one of the things we... Um we did was when you listen to this, um, see if I can get that back. You know, when you listen to this, the other direction, it's kind of cool. When you wrote down your list, if you, if you were following this and you were, um, if you were following it and you were writing it down, it's a good, look, watch this. Now put your list, turn it around. Do number one is to have enough faith when you hear about this Buddha who spent six and a half years trying to find this answer, okay? And then we're putting faith in the fact of what? Are we putting faith in the fact that we, you know, faith that we believe he found the answer? No, we're putting faith that he found something. That's what we're doing. We're putting faith in the fact this guy probably found something. And this guy's clearly telling us he's not a god he knows the gods and he knows the gods exist he knows the davis exist he knows a lot of things exist and we can get to know them too it's not hidden from us we're human beings and depending on how open our minds become leads to how much of that we get to experience okay but faith here is putting faith in this what did this guy find? And I, I'm not supposed to call him a guy, but I'm just saying, you know, what did this guy find? He's saying he's a human being. And he's saying, you're a human being and you can do this too. So that's amazing to begin with. So then you say, okay, I, this is what I did. I basically said, okay, everything else has failed. There's a lot of things that had been tried for me at that point. And, you know, putting my faith in this, what have I got to lose? You see? What have I got to lose? And so visiting was most helpful to pay respect and find Bonte V. Ramsey at the temple in Washington, DC. <laughs> and there he was arriving the day after I knocked on the door and said I wanted a meditation table uh, teacher. He's flying in from California to Washington, DC and paying respect and then deciding to listen to what he has to say. That's giving ear. And giving ear is very helpful in learning the Dhamma because you, you cannot, his position, and I, I always liked this, you know, uh, Bonte's position on this was they just heard it and they have tremendous capacity even today to learn by parroting. Unfortunately, sometimes they parrot things without finding out what it means, which is not very helpful, okay? <laughs> like having a monk teach them something in Pali without telling them what it means and then having everybody think, oh, this place is glorious. <laughs> All these children are able to say this, but they have no idea what it means. But that was something I really resented when I, when I found out what was happening with some of the situations like that. But hearing the Dhamma, Bhante was curious what would happen if we didn't didn't um, have books and we weren't reading and we just listened what would happen. It was his personal experiment and it didn't do too badly because people started really succeeding by learning maybe for the first time in their lives that they could just listen to learn something and they started to learn what giving ear actually meant, hearing the Dhamma and then examining the meaning with him. And then uh, moving from there to examine examination of the meaning privately and reflecting on it after we left the Dhamma hall, you see? So you write notes as you're listening. That's okay. 
and then you reflect on it. You do not write the whole adventure for your day and detailed of what you think about the whole thing, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you just write the, the tiny notes of what you heard in the session, okay? And then you examine the meaning and keep examining it in your mind and then reflect on it as you're walking, as you're working and moving around from day one. And the enthusiasm that comes out of this is really amazing because you, you start reflecting on it. And then the more you reflect on it, the more you want to go deeper. So this goes back to that one phrase I told you was preserved in all of the traditions universally, uh, universally preserving um, Swakato, Bhagavato, Dhamma, Sadatiko, Akaliko, Ei, Pasako, Opanaiko, Pachitam, Waitabo, Winuiti. What's it mean? And it basically is saying that the Dhamma was originally easy to understand, immediately effective, that you could feel the difference of something changing, immediately effective, inviting deeper inspection. There it is, inviting. The enthusiasm is inviting deeper inspection. That's inviting scrutiny, inviting more scrutiny into the system, and then striving. And the striving was to repeat, keep on repeating, repeating and repeating what you just did, that cycle of listening and, and reviewing and practicing and doing that. So faith becomes a whole different thing. Now, when you look at faith after you've learned this and you've decided to go back to teach it, okay, at this point, where is faith? Faith is um, almost like, paying respects to the Buddha is like saying, oh my goodness, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you showed up. <laughs> I mean, I'm so glad that I bumped into this and that I found it. And so faith becomes a, a different kind of thing, but it isn't a blind faith. And I think that's a very critical difference in everything. Now, when we have this blind faith, is it useless? No, it certainly isn't useless. And I'll tell you, I mean, I could tell you dozens of stories about this, but it's not useless at all. And one of the things that's very special in the Christian faith is faith in, in, uh, in Jesus, in God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Ghost. And we, we did a lot in some of the churches I was involved in, in, in making a friend of the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is with you, and the Holy Ghost will help you, and things like this. And you know what? This isn't a lie, but what is it? I don't know what it is. All I can tell you is you're not alone anymore. It's choosing not to be alone to it takes you out of the framework of you're, you're stuck. Okay, you're stuck here. You're stuck in this place of everything is happening to me, but God says, okay, it'll be okay. It'll all come out in the end. Okay, but you're stuck, you're caught in this place of everything is happening to me. And you don't know anything about the idea of it's, it, it's, it could all change if you understood that you have the power uh, to actually change your perspective of how you see what happens. You know, there's a story I've told before. There was a story about I um, was going to a counselor once I went to the counselor and he was a little late and I was sitting there a long time in the lobby. And then as I got up and walked down the hall to have my meeting with the counselor, I said, how come you were so late? And he said, oh, it's been a hard morning. I'm really glad you waited. <laughs> you know, and I said, well, what happened? He said, well, this woman came in. This woman came in and she was so upset. She just wanted to be admitted to the hospital. And I was had to go through this whole thing with her about what happened. And she said she never used to touch her hu husband's computer, but she had to do something for school for her daughter. She's working on the computer and she lost his entire business off the computer. And she was devastated. And she didn't, you know, she was just absolutely beside herself. He's going to kill me. You know, he's going to get really, really mad. And I don't, I don't think he's ever talked about a backup and blah, 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 blah. And she finally, she, he admitted her, but she went on and on about this, how awful and devastating it was. Absolutely devastating. Then about uh, a couple hours, he, 
took her and got her through admission, came back, did another meeting. The next person that came in said, well, you know, the thing is that uh, I, I, I was okay. I was okay. Everything was going well for me. And then I lost most of what is on the computer. <laughs> he just sat there and he went, two in one morning i can't handle this today what do i tell her and i said well, he's, what happened she said well you know i looked at that and i said well this could be a new horizon i mean maybe we can get out of all the junk if we set it up again we won't have as much junk in the computer as we had before you know and maybe it could all be the beginning of a new day because you know how much stuff you get on the computer that wasn't there and he sat there and he went like this so you're okay that you don't need to get checked in <laughs> she said no i don't need to go in the hospital i i just need to try and digest this whole thing and hopefully my husband will sit down and be reasonable about it you know when i get home but see the whole thing was totally different totally completely different one of them looked at this at the at the incident as the end of time and the other person looked at it as an opportunity for a new day um and actually she's not far off because you know if you ditch your computer and just get a new one you have to start all over again and if you keep everybody away from you you might even be able to put like two years of files on there instead of having somebody help you who puts 15 years of files on there for you <laughs> so so what is it that i'm talking about I'm talking about perspective of how you decide to see the world and nobody can do this but you. This is where it all changes. So, and you're, you're, you know, that's, that's the thing is how, how it, how we see things is the beginning of real change, but we don't know we're not taught most of us are not taught systematically that we have the power to decide how we're going to how we're going to see things do we and it depends on the family that you grew up sometimes you have a great grandmother who's going to tell you everything's going to be you know turning out all right don't be worried about it you see but then not everybody has that grandmother <laughs> and then everything goes differently this is the whole thing yeah so the faith, the faith element, the faith element, going back to the faith of this, is you are more powerful than you think you are. And faith, where, where do we put it? Where, if we went back, this is something you can try for me. Go back to the dictionary. I don't know if I have my thing here. But you go back and say, well, what does faith really say? If we defined faith, we can go back and research it this way. And we can find out, let's see. This is how I do it when I get frustrated like this. I'll just start defining things that lead to defining things that lead to defining things. And I could be here, I could be here half the day. <laughs> so, you know. <clears throat> They're having a problem with this too. <laughs> This is great. What is real faith? Why are most people trapped by fears and worries? Because they lack faith. But what is faith? Is it positive thinking, a feeling, one church's affiliation, the belief that Jesus died for your sins, confidence, hope, or is it something far more? Why do millions misunderstand this subject? And then we go to the Bible for answers. Of course, we go to the Bible for answers. And let's see, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Well, there we are. We're trying to please somebody again. <laughs> and the frustration of trying to please somebody else all the time without being able to understand how things work. And I think the difference is right there, we run into an issue of do we want to see how things actually work? Is that how deep we want to go? And a great many of us want to go deeper. But here it's saying we can't, we, it's impossible if you're working exclusively to please God, you can't please God without faith. It's an incredible statement, and yet it's right there in the Bible. Just think anything a person does is attempting 
in, in attempting to be Christian. Of course, this is about Christian. Now, when I, I have to tell you something, when I was had the breakdown and I was, they had this big test that they gave you. And this remarkable test, I was really out of it when they gave it to me. And it was really too soon, in my opinion, to have given it to me. And I had issues with the director of the department, who I knew anyway, because I was the president of the Chamber of Commerce and I knew everybody. And, and she was the, uh, de- the head of the department. And I'd sit there and talk to her about this. Why did you give me this test? It's ridiculous. And I don't want the, uh, I, I wouldn't finish it. And they got angry at me. I said, I refuse to finish it because you've written the entire test based on the fact that I must be a Christian or I don't exist. And I was absolutely angry at this this psychological examination because it was entirely based on Christianity. And the answers were, there were no other answers except trusting in God, faith in God, this in God, that in God, this is God. And I felt like screaming, God is dog spelled backwards. <laughs> you know, I felt so angry. This was something they used to say in, in uh, you know, the 1960s, they'd run around screaming this because nobody would explain what's really happening, what was really going on with Vietnam. And everybody was really frustrated. And you'd say, have faith. Okay, so faith to me, what I learned in one church was faith without works is dead. That was interesting. Okay. And faith without works. This is James chapter five, verse three, I think, if you look in the Bible. And what that's basically saying, faith without works is dead. That the person who simply says, I'm here because of my faith, but then that person is entirely different. And um, then the person who is working the works or living the light of of this uh, of the light of goodness, light of wholesomeness, and everything that exists in any religion, you see, that person is different than I'm this because of my faith and period, and I didn't want that anymore. So, if a person though is wanting to feel not alone in any number of situations, faith in the Holy Ghost is a good idea. <laughs> Because you can convince your brain really easily you're not alone. And what you're doing is you're playing a game of, but what if I was not alone? How would I handle this if I was not alone? And it puts you in a more enthusiasm, more strength, much more strength and readiness to solve a problem. If you look at this aspect, what do you think? What do you think you? Yeah. Sarah, what do you think? about faith yeah I think it's really interesting and actually Hugh asked the question I had about it where where do we start with the faith and just hearing what you've been saying and reflecting about it it, it's just taken me back to what was you know what was I looking for because when you when you're looking you don't necessarily know well you don't know what you're going to find but there seems to be um some kind of deep sense of connection whether it's a search for a meaning or a search for love or a search for understanding or for connection um or like you said with the holy spirit maybe a search for not feeling so alone so i'm wondering if there's an aspect of faith that we can we can access that's within ourselves that's a it's a not giving up on ourselves at some right. level, when we're looking for a search, where we, we haven't given up. And you mentioned a, a personal crash, and that's a prompting for a, for a search that's a not giving up. And so I wonder if there's a, there's a faith that we can look to within ourselves that obviously we're in a context of, of looking to the Buddha's teaching. And then when we find that and we investigate and we scrutinize and we practice and we apply the right effort and we find the enthusiasm and all of these things, the faith, the faith develops and it becomes uh, more sustained. But the originating faith, I'm wondering, is, is, is like a, a tiny seed somehow very buried inside us that 
that we don't give up on. You know, I, I, I don't know about that. I've thought about that many times, but I don't really know. But I can tell you, um, you know, when I was very tiny, it was like, now I, now I lay me down to sleep. Uh, and this whole thing, and that's left over. Now I lay me down to sleep. Um, I can't remember it anymore. Now I lay me down to sleep. But I remember if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. See, now that's left over from the bubonic plague. That's when that came into being, okay? And it was a desperation a poem. And that was handed down all through Europe and uh, into England, everywhere, all the way into Ireland, everywhere, you know, in, and that was, that's probably what came down just through the family, is saying that prayer. Another one was, um, two little eyes to look to God, two little ears to hear his word, two little feet to walk his way, and hands to serve him day by day. Now that one stuck with me too. It didn't have the same effect exactly, <laughs> you know, but that that had the effect of, of looking, you can take that whole thing and turn it into any religion you like. You can use it in the Buddhist structure in Sunday school. I've done it. And they don't even realize that it's a Christian prayer, but it's not a Christian prayer. And it's two little eyes to look to the good, two little eyes to look to the good, two little ears to hear its way, two little... Um, you know, each part of you is doing something and, and you're keeping, you're keeping the wholesome day by day. You're keeping the precepts day by day, you see, and you can take these and convert them. And all of this is a pure, a pure line all the way through. It doesn't matter what religion you look to. It doesn't matter if you, you don't, you're not insulting the Quran. You're not insulting the Torah. You're not insulting the Bible. You're not insulting anything. If you're talking purely about wholesome behavior or unwholesome behavior of walking in the purest way, in, in the clearest way, or getting into trouble by not keeping your precepts, you see, you're talking about the, the basis of humanity. What do you really want? You, you want to be safe. You want to be housed and clothed and fed. You want to be safe. You want to feel safe. Then you want to build schools and you want to teach your children to go in the same direction. You don't want them dealing with politics and all this other stuff. You want them to, to go after the same thing. That all of us need to be the same uh, the same. Thing doesn't make sense to me but what does make sense to me sometimes when I look at that whole situation of what goes on with different faiths and things I could say that I think we can say that not one faith on this planet is pure enough to say everybody should have this faith and there should be no other but we could say that it's not lawful for maybe somebody to set up a faith that is full of hate and you know stopping oppression and that sort of stuff. If there's any of that, I wouldn't mind living in a country that simply designated, you can't have that here. You need to go somewhere else. Uh, I can't understand uh, the, the uh, interpretation of a lot of things right now. I've lost it and I don't really care much anymore. I just want to keep doing what I'm doing now. Uh, but can I, uh, uh, Sister Kima, uh, I yeah. want to kind of give a, a different definition, like uh, for faith, uh, where Buddha is uh, talking about faith. Uh, okay. uh, Buddha says that, uh, say, if a person has faith, he will come and give ear. That is, he will listen to the Dhamma. When he listens to the Dhamma, he gains confidence. When he gains confidence, he will practice. When he uh, practice, he again that, gains... That's, that's just what we just did, Chanti. That's, that's it, what I'm uh, saying. That, that's yeah. what faith is about. It's uh -huh. the base. So now, uh, just to consider that and uh, give a, another uh, uh, aspect, the other uh, way a person comes to the Dhamma is he comes to investigate. Uh, because of his uh, willingness to investigate, he hears the Dhamma. Because he hears the Dhamma, he practices. And because he practices, he gains further uh, confidence in the Dhamma. So because it uh, works. <laughs> the faith is uh, in, in Buddha's uh, uh, thing is about the starting point. Uh, so you can come to the 
uh, teaching. So uh, faith is uh, considered like a spark. Uh, if you are in a kind, you mentioned many times uh, going to the uh, camping, you know. So you need a fire starter. So that fire starter uh, can be a, uh, uh, can be a kind of a, a matchstick, or it can be a kind of a stick. Uh, the uh, the uh, stones they have starter stones. So in that way, the faith is uh, kind of mentioned. <clears throat> in in uh, kind of other uh, religions or uh, other things, their faith can be a little bit more uh, elaborate because uh, they are not, not kind of giving the next step. That is your own personal confidence and uh, 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 the method to kind of uh, 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 yeah. verify. That, that yeah, is what I, I, uh, Buddha yeah. kind of has a distinction. It gives a that's method true. where you can yourself verify yeah, so, I think that's uh, really is, uh, lesser important. Sam. So that's 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 a really good way of looking at it as having it as a starting point because then it it gets you to do something you never did in these other in these other groups. You never questioned beyond being dictated to what you should do next. See, that's the problem. I guess that's one of the biggest factors in Buddhism. And that's one of the things that some one professor was arguing. I can't remember who it was. I can't remember where I was when I listened to this, but was basically saying, you know, um, he was saying that's why Buddhism shouldn't be designated as a religion. It's a science. It's a science of your mind. You know, and it, this is this uh -huh. a, one of the reasons that Albert Einstein said that in the future, everyone would become Buddhist. He believed that he has been noted as saying that several different occasions. And look at who he was and look at what a great scientist he was and a mathematician and everything and logic and all wrapped up in this. And this is why he's saying that, because he's saying, basically, if you if you do working everything as logic, your faith that this is something that might continue to help mankind, it's because it's not fixed. It's not locked in stone. It encourages your personal uh, development and your personal, tells you it's okay, don't be shy. Uh, don't, don't be shy, just take and open up your confidence to investigate and ask questions. That's why I was late this morning. <laughs> I had somebody sitting here asking me questions and questions. I said, well, it's okay. It felt good because the retreat's in a couple of weeks. So I go ahead, pound away. <laughs> and it was having fun, you know, just having question after question after question and, uh, and feeling good that basically I can explain it. Uh, and that makes me feel more confident in it because I've experienced it and I know it. And then I'm seeing it. I'm just trying to show you if you try this, if this is what happens, you see. <laughs> so yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, th thank you, Sister Kima and Bandy. I, I have an another couple of questions, but uh, they're more specific in detail. Uh, in the Chanki Sutta, in paragraph twenty, it said, mm -hmm. uh, "Realizes with the body the supreme truth." Could you say a little bit more about that? Um, realizes with the body that the, well, yeah, paragraph 20. First of, all, first of all, one of the things that I think comes to mind right away is where is the body? Can you tell me where the body is? Uh, it's, uh, as the Buddha said, it's from the crown of the head to the sole of your feet. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's not there in a lot of other things. <laughs> That's one, the one thing that it's not there. Uh, the the um, other places might say you can start here and includes the heart, the heart and the rest of the body. And it's not going to get into the, um, uh, where is it, in 20, in, did you say it was in 20? Yes, I think it was in paragraph 20. Um... Hmm. No. No. Hold on a moment. Uh... I remember hearing that, but I will say this. See, the thing is that um, funny thing. 
They're teaching I, you. They're teaching you through your mind, through your head. They're teaching you to memorize things and learn things in other situations. Okay. And you're, you're, you're using your head, but you don't go testing everything. And in Buddhism, he wants you to test everything. We have to remember what was said in the Kalama Sutta. We go back to the Kalama Sutta to look at this. But when it says accepting it, I remember where, where it said something about the body, but I can't tell you where it was. Um, it is, uh, uh, he applies his will, uh, having applied his will, he scrutinizes, scrutinizes, he strives. Uh, resolutely striving, he realizes with the body, the supreme truth and sees it by penetrating it with wisdom. Where are you? On 20. Uh, you can see the highlighted, sees it, uh, it by penetrating with wisdom, the highlighted. Uh, the, oh, or read highlighted. after 890. Huh? 890. The, there is a uh, reference. Oh, 890, okay. Huh? okay. He scrutinized, he started, applied with will. Where does he realize this? Oh, he realizes with the body, the supreme truth and sees it by penetrating it with wisdom. Um, well, your body is from your head all the way to your feet and your mind, mind and body have this connection. So when you're relaxing, constantly emptying the mind, but you're also emptying the body of all tension and everything, you're you're become, you're you're recognizing, <laughs> the, realizing the body. Um, we, he realizes with the body the supreme truth, total complete relaxation of the body and loss of the body. That's what this is referring to. Your loss of the body yeah. and your supreme bliss of the jhana. You understand? That's like total realization of the body. This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. That's what this is about. And now when you sends it down to tell me what the reference was, um, wait a minute, enthusiasm. Um, I just saw it. Now I lost it. I think it is just men mentioning that uh, with practice, you realize it. And uh, it, where is it? it? What's the number? What's the number of the notes? Because the notes were uh, included eight, on uh, uh, 890 was there over there. Okay, wait a second. We can check the notes. 890. Hmm. I think it is just referring to uh, your practice. With, uh, with practice, yeah. you uh, and when you are practicing, you are using the body. So that, that must be the only thing. Eight, uh, 889. Okay. 889, he investigates things in terms of impermanence. Yeah, okay, impermanence, suffering, and and um, and um, the, impersonal, inside, uh, the in, kind of impersonal nature of everything. The stage thus seems to be that of insight contemplation, and insight contemplation to later. It, mean, it means that uh, you are, um, although applying his will, appears similar to striving. The, um, the former may be understood as the exertion undertaken prior to insight contemplation. There's, see now the problem with the notes, yeah. The problem with the notes is remember Nanamoli was basically in the school of the Vasudhimaga. You see, totally wrapped in, in wrap, wrapped around the, the, the school of the Vasudhimaga. So they're always talking in the notes. A lot of times we find talking about in things in the Mental notes. body and all those things, uh, but I don't think yeah, that. Well, yeah, but see, they're talking about exertion undertaking prior to insight contemplation. They're talking about the separation of practices. You right. see? Yeah. So when we when we're talking to you about it, we're talking to you about it, but we're staying away from something that talks about insight contemplation is a separate, totally separated from what you're doing when you're you, you do go in and out to experience this, but what he is talking about um, is basically, yeah, it's the MA. Yeah, it's that the, is Vishuddhimaga, I, I agree with you. The MA is, the MA means the commentary for the Majima Nikaya, the Atakata, okay? So they, they, they um, took all the information for teaching the Ba, the, the, Buddhist teachings, they, they preserved the Nikaya 
by putting it together, but then I can't remember how many hundred of years it was, and then they did the MA, and the MA was the Majima Nikaya Atakata, and each one of the Nikayas has an Atakata, okay? So this is from coming from the commentary later, and I was doing something last week thinking to myself, yeah, so most of these things that you're talking about that way, it couldn't have been long after the Buddha was gone that right effort slid out of out of line. And See, when right effort, he uh, uh, also mentioned he realizes nibbana with the mental body, which is also a kind of an extrapolation of the body. Uh, so uh, sometimes these things happen that uh, like a body of breath. Uh, they kind of extrapolate uh, based on uh, the later interpretation or uh, analysis. Yeah, yeah, the interpretation analysis, right? And 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 Bhikkhu Bodhi took that back, took it back. It was wisdom publications that Neto withheld it, yes. withheld it from one of the uh, instructions. It was really kind of crazy. <laughs> what happened? He tried to take it back, but Bhikkhu Bodhi doesn't have the power to stop wisdom publications from doing whatever it wants with what he wrote because of his contract. It was a yeah, subject. he kept it in one of the uh, this thing and uh, uh, and he removed it from one. That that is what happened. I think he in, the, it in, the, from, in the in the edition actually, I had. Huh? Actually, he removed it from th from two or three. There were four of them, okay. and he removed it from two or three of them. Only in one, it stayed. Oh. And I can't which I the one it, I stayed, I think so. I think it was the what was 118 is where it stayed. 118 is the one where it stayed, isn't it? And that's what was irritating. They they refused to take it out. The the publisher, hmm. the publisher, okay, decided hmm. not to take it out of 118. And yeah, I'm tipped. You better believe I'm tipped because. Uh, because he researched it and he changed it legitimately and he asked for it to be changed wherever it was and they didn't do it so when now they're printing it they're they're um yeah they didn't do it in 118 is the place they didn't do it they left it in and, I and think it, it does go, not mean a lot uh with his body i don't i don't think it is very significant uh uh, statement. Uh, it just means that you uh, practice, uh, and that practice which you are doing is uh, with well, the body I and think, mind. So that that is the only thing I I I can. No, of, but see, no, mind. but see what Bhante was saying. It has a lot to do with concentrating on the breath. That's what it had to do with. Yeah, uh, I, I breathe mm -hmm. out, experiencing the whole body of breath. You see, and that's not true. The whole body, yeah. The whole body you do experience, but yeah. not the whole body of breath, because there is no body of breath. And so by saying there is a body of breath in the first place is saying that you concentrate so hard on your breath, you believe it's a thing, like shaped like this. And I remember when I was talking to one person, they said, just pretend it's like like something like this. It's just this big, see? Uh, one one thought came to me, uh, Sister Kema, just uh, listen to me. Yeah. Uh, one yeah. of the things would be that uh, in the Brahmin, uh, that time there may be a, a kind of a, a, a belief that only after you kind of pass away, uh, you will be able to kind of uh, attain uh, uh, moksha is uh, in the way considered to be a, a act which happens at the death. So maybe uh, Buddha is saying that as you are there now uh, in this body, you will be able to realize the uh, truth and attain Nibbana. That could be also a kind of indication basically giving as a body. Uh, it is not something you have to wait till your uh, give up your body or uh, you die that could be also uh, one uh, way of looking at it. that that's a, just a thought but these are all in the instructions for the breathing meditation yeah, but i'm saying the hindu way of uh, thinking about uh, moksha is when you pass away uh, you are uh, totally free the the concept of moksha as a living person i uh, as far as i know I, is not there so uh, uh, maybe that is the reason he is distinguishing uh, that uh, concept uh, by mentioning the body. That as you are, uh, you will be able to attain uh, Nirvana in this very But body. see, okay, but let me read you the note that Bhikkhu Bodhi had in when he took ah. this out, when he changed it, so you understand. Mm -hmm. In MA, it explained experiencing the whole body. 
Sabakaya Patisambedi. Uh, okay, as signifying that the meditator becomes aware of each in breath and out breath through its three phases beginning, middle, and end. In the first edition, I followed this explanation and added in brackets of breath after the whole body. Now in retrospect, however, this interpretation seems to be forced and I now prefer to take the phrase quite literally. It is also difficult to see how Pati Samveda it, uh, Vedi is, could mean is aware of. It doesn't mean that, as it is based on a verb meaning just experiencing, just experiencing breath. You see? So, so, um, or just experiencing the body, you see? And Bhante always said what it did to him was he thought that it, it made it made him feel as a meditator, he had to pay more, more attention to the breath because they were talking a lot about noticing it has a beginning, has a middle, has an end. There is a great deal of emphasis on the learning of Anicca. And the great and the idea has been passed along through commentary, not not by the Buddha, but through commentary that to to uh, discover Anicca Dukkha and Anatta, uh, uh, yeah, Anicca Dukkha and Anatta, that's all you need to be enlightened. And that is just not in the text. And I challenge anybody to come and sit down and show me how they can say, decide to come to that conclusion because it just simply isn't real. You know, there's no place in the text that you can find where it says the three characters, understand the three characteristics and you understand the Dhamma. That's one of my arguments. He who understands dependent origination understands the Dhamma. He who understands the Dhamma understands dependent origination. You can find that 25 or 30 times. <clears throat> okay, it's like five, it's like six times per sutta, and you can find it in three or four different ways of looking at that idea. But you can't find what you what I can't locate is Understanding Anicca Dukkha and Anatta, he who understands Anicca Dukkha and Anatta understands the, the Dhamma, and he who understands the Dhamma understands Anicca Dukkha and Anatta. I can't find that. If you can find it, please show it to me. And I'm serious because this is a fluid teaching and it is a fluid learning all the time. It is not in stone the way some people have written about us. We're not in stone. We're the least in stone of anybody out there because we're inviting people constantly come ask questions and challenge us all through the night. That's what we want to hear. We want to be jumping back and forth on this. Yeah, go ahead. Uh huh. Okay, thank you, uh, Sadima and Banta. That's uh, that's quite helpful. Uh, I've got one more question. <laughs> I, 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 go ahead. Got one more question around what you were yeah. saying around Lama Sutta and. Uh, and, and the way that uh, uh, it was um, uh, translated. But there were two little phrases which I was particularly taken with, and they were soft wisdom and gentle wisdom. Um, and so I'm yeah, just interested out. again around the choice of that description. Let me try to see, you know, and I, I, I just can't believe I can't put I that in my paragraph, hand on. Paragraph, last paragraph. Last paragraph. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, loving acceptance present moment. What is it? Where? Oh, I see it. Yeah. Well, okay. On the other hand, we can rightly accept anything which, when practiced and perfected, leads to unconditional love, contentment, and soft wisdom. Soft wisdom really means not argumentative wisdom. That's what it really means. Okay, you know, argumentative wisdom. I don't know. That's what comes up for me. It's just soft. It's con it's contentment that you have this wisdom and you see it very clearly, very softly. It's a kind of wisdom. Rightly accept anything that when practiced and perfected leads to unconditional love, contentment, and soft wisdom. Seeing what is essential as essential and not taking what is unessential and bringing it back into the essential and arguing with yourself all the time. It's a soft, gentle acceptance of the present time. You get what I mean? Am I, am I getting sort of close? Okay. Then these things allow us to develop a happy, tranquil, peaceful mind. 
So anything that is allowing you, when uh, you discover things in this teaching that fit perfectly and they they operate perfectly and and that's and it's just happening smoothly. All right, that leads you to a happy, tranquil, peaceful mind, to tranquility, contentment, and gentle wisdom. Like he says it just below there, loving acceptance of the present moment. Well, we, I would change this now and say present time, but present moment's okay in there, I guess. And, and they encourage everyone to um, practice these uplifting qualities as much as possible. So see, the two of them sat down and said, the problem with the uh, Kalama Sutta, when you get to the big version of it, and I just wish I could find what I, it's frustrating me that I can't find what um i wonder if he did a index in the back let me see if he did for the kalama um yeah wait a minute 20 and 21 all right page 20 and 21 i wonder why i didn't see that before here you go listen okay listen very carefully to this this is what i couldn't find earlier the Kalamas of Kesaputta approached the Blessed One and said to him, Bhante, there are some ascetics and Brahmins who come from Kesaputta and they explain and elucidate their doctrines, but disparage and denigrate, deride and denounce the doctrines of others. But then some other ascetics and Brahmins, they come to Kesaputta and they explain and elucidate their own doctrines, but disparage denigrate, deride, and denounce the doctrines of others. And we are perplexed and in doubt, Bhante, as to which of these good aesthetics will speak the truth and which ones speak a falsehood. It is fitting for you to be perplexed, Kalamas. It is fitting for you to be in doubt. Doubt has arisen in you about a perplexing matter. Come, Kalamas, do not go by oral tradition, by lineage of teaching, by hearsay, by a collection of scriptures, by logical reasoning, by inferential, in inferential reasoning, by reasoned cogitation, by acceptance of a view upon after pondering, by seeming competence of a speaker, or because you think that the ascetic is our guru. But when, Kalamas, you know for yourselves that these things are unwholesome, these things are blameworthy. These things are censured by the wise. These things, if accepted and undertaken, they will lead to harm and suffering. And then you should abandon them. What do you think, Kalamas? What greed, hatred, and delusion arise in a person? It is, is it for his welfare or for his harm? For his harm, Bhante. Kalamas, one overcome by greed, hatred, and delusion, with mind obsessed by them, destroys life, takes what is not given, transgresses with another wife, speaks falsehoods, encourages others to do likewise, and will that lead to his harm and suffering for a long time? Yes, Bhante, it will. What do you think? Are these things wholesome or unwholesome? Unwholesome, Bhante, blameworthy or blameless? Blameworthy, Bhante, censured or praised by the wise? Censured by the wise, Bhante. Accepted and undertaken, do they lead to harm and suffering or not? And how do you take it? They're accepted and, uh, and undertaken, these things lead to harm and suffering, so we take it. Thus, Kalamas, when we said, how Kalamas, do not go by oral tradition, etc. But when you know for yourselves, these things are unwholesome, these things are blameworthy, these things are censured by the wise, these things, if undertaken in practice, will lead to harm and suffering, then you should abandon them. And it is because of this that this is said, Ham Kalamas do not go by oral tradition, etc., and so forth. But because you think the ascetic is our guru, but when you know for yourselves these things are wholesome, these things are blameless, these things are praised by the wise, these things, if accepted and undertaken, lead to welfare and happiness, then you should live in accordance with them. So what do you think, Kalamas, when a person is without greed, hatred, and delusion, 
Is it for his welfare or for his harm? It is for his welfare, Bunty. And Kalamas, a person not overcome by greed, hatred, and delusion, whose mind is not obsessed by them, does not destroy life, take what is not given, transgress another's wife, or speak falsehoods, nor does he encourage others to do likewise. Will that lead to his welfare and happiness for a long time? Yes, Bonte. Well, what do you think, Kalamas? Are these things wholesome or unwholesome? Wholesome, Bonte. Blameworthy or blameless? Blameless, Bonte. Censured or praised by the wise? Praised by the wise, Bonte. Accepted and undertaken? Do they lead to welfare and happiness or not? How do you take it? Accepted and undertaken, the things lead to welfare and happiness. And so we take it. Thus, Kalamas, when we said, come Kalamas, do not go by oral tradition alone. But when you know for yourselves, these things are wholesome. These things are blameless. These things are praised by the wise. These things, if accepted and undertaken, lead to welfare and happiness. Then you should live in accordance with them. It's because of this that this was said. That's the part I left out in the beginning. That's what comes out of Bhikkhu Bodhi's books, book on the harmony and um, what is it? Let's say communal harmony, social and communal harmony. This book is only this thick. You ought to get it. I'm not kidding. It's good reading, has simple examples, great for Dhamma talks, you know, but um, you need to send away for that one. The the thing is, that's encouragement for you to personally investigate your personal responsibility. Nobody else is telling you this is it and nothing else is true. That's the thing that this is different here, you see? And the other thing is last week, several people said, well, did he say that I had to give up my religion or give up my faith or give up this to study what he said? I said, nobody said that in Buddhism. You still want to have the tree spirits in your backyard? You can still have them. You want to still worship another deity just for the sake of that deity? If you want to, you can do it. He never said you have to give up everything to take this on. He said, learn how it works and learn how to live this way and learn how to study this way and you will be happy and blameless and you will be good. That's it. Okay? Yeah? So this is where we separate the, the boys from the men and the men from the boys <laughs> and the girls from the women and so forth here. <laughs> challenge, challenge and try to figure out. This was a good class, really. We got five more minutes in here. I thought we'd go over two hours. <laughs> but okay, this is the way it should be. Seriously, you should be able to question everything. I'm sorry that we lost um, Sarna earlier because of the little thing about the Hindu position on things I was waiting for Sarna to peep up <laughs> he wasn't he wasn't here anymore but um okay that's really good though yeah so um I want to say thank you for all coming okay bring a friend next time let's have 20 people that'll be fun <laughs> I don't know we'll have a couple more weeks before the retreat or during the retreat I think I'm going to ask Bonte to do this class while I'm gone okay and um, then when I come back, we'll see what happens next. <laughs> We're always looking to see what happens next. Yeah, next thing is a PET scan. It's <laughs> my whole life thrives around what's, ne what's the next test. So next test is a PET scan on August the 4th. So uh, that's my day to do the PET scan. And um, there wasn't anything extraordinary in the biopsy. That was interesting. I wasn't real surprised. I was kind of frustrated that there was nothing really that they could each. It was so funny. She said, well, stick her again, stick her again. <laughs> I thought, boy, these two are having fun, you know? Well, I can only see this little tiny thing. Well, stick her again. So they pulled a couple of samples out. I don't think they really found anything. She said she would get the results by uh, Tuesday, but um, it'll be a surprise if there's anything. So either all the machines are wrong, that's one thing, could be, or they're sending me somebody else's x-rays. I've, I've heard of that in movies before. <laughs> so maybe all these tests are getting mixed up with someone else's, and I'm not really bad off at all. <laughs> 
And last night I got really angry. I woke up and my neck was hurting and I sort of said, okay, that's enough. And I took the brace off, wrapped my, my neck in a scarf and tied it and went back to sleep and then woke up again and said, okay, that's enough. It's too hot. And I took it off and then I just laid over a pillow on my stomach and just fell right to sleep. And this morning I got up and I don't know, but I feel a lot better and I'm, you know, just uh, playing with this, but the sprain is still there, but it's not there as bad as it is. I'm not ready to go play tennis, but we're going to see what happens next. So let's uh, say prayer. <laughs> Okay, may suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, the devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Three, so I remember that exists in Buddhism is three. Just remember that and you'll do fine. <laughs> Just three. How do we count, mommy? Three. <laughs> what do we say in class? Three. What's the answer? Three. Well, that's okay for first grade, but you're going to have trouble after that in math. Okay, <laughs> I'll see you later. Bye-bye. Thank you, sister. Thank you, Bante. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.